10, 9, ignition sequence start. All engines are running. Lift off! Lift off! The clock is over. We're underway. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And with the mighty roar as we break free from captivity, it's time now for KerbalCast, Episode 53, ELE, Extinction Level Event. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. And I am your LMP, that's Lunar Module Pilot Biff Aldrin, RCMP, Command Module Pilot Nostromo. Coming up in today's program, did you know that asteroids can float? It's our progress in the game. This is not the game I wanted, a post read by DK. And J. Arthur has part one of his mining tutorials, and you can learn how to fly hover jets and free tosses flight fundamentals. Your letters and tweets in the mission briefing. So you you understand why we chose the intro to today's program that we did? Yeah, because the new movie Star Lord and his Dino Pals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. uh, We're recording this uh, on uh, June the 13th of 2015 and this is the week that jurassic world opened proving yet again that human beings even after four movies have yet to figure out dinosaurs always break free yeah they always go on rampages (laughs) they always eat you we should have thought this through yeah you would think after four movies, somebody would go, you know, maybe we should give up on this whole dinosaur thing. You think thing. after all the things that happen in the movies, people wouldn't go to these things. You know, like, <laughs> like as much as they're told, oh, no, it's safe this time. Like, nah. Speaking of movies, I had a Kerbal in the Wild sighting this week. Oh, yeah? I went to see uh, Avengers Age of Ultron for the second time. Okay. And I was wearing my Kerbal shirt. And yeah. the guy that sold me the ticket... He saw the shirt and he went, he went, I love that game. Yeah. And I was like, I do a podcast. And I said, I will give you a shout out. Uh, guy's name is Isaiah. Hey, Isaiah. Isaiah, shout out, Kerbal in the Wild. Yeah, I love, I love to wear my shirt because sometimes I'll, I'll be out in public. <laughs> I, I love it when you wear a shirt too. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, old Mr. Harry over here. Um, no, seriously, when I wear my shirt, um, uh, the Kerbal shirt in public, um, sometimes I'll go out in public and nobody will say anything. And then just out of nowhere, somebody will be, you know, oh, Kerbal, I love that game. And I've, I've never, I've yet to run into anybody that has seen the shirt and said, oh, Kerbal, I have mild feelings about that game. Yeah. It's like you either, you either love that game or you bought it and you forgot about it. Well, I, I wanted to do my shout out to Isaiah. Do you want to talk some actual Kerbal? Um, well, let me go and give you my progress. Okay. I don't have any, and it's because of real weird reasons. So, like, I'm normally work, out of work. I'm normally out of town. That's that's not the weird reason. I'm out of town either Monday through Thursday or Tuesday through Friday. Mm-hmm. And this was a Tuesday through Friday week, which usually means I can only get in like an hour or so of Kerbal before we, you know, including you know coming back home, unpacking, unwinding, you know, meeting with the girlfriend and all that. I can usually get an hour, maybe. Right. Um. I wasn't able to get that hour just because like all these like weird circumstances kept popping up. We go out to eat and we're, you know, we get all of our food, get everything. And then we're just still waiting and we're waiting on the check and we wait for like 30 minutes. And I'm like, okay, this is taken from my potential Kerbal time. Mm-hmm. Um, our waitress just left. She didn't quit. So, like she had something come up and she just left. She didn't even like tell anyone she was just gone. Well, you mean like left the building? Yeah. Like, like, like gone. your waitress has left the building. Yeah. Like she was, she was gone. And like, everyone's like, where, and we're like, Hey, we'd like to pay. And we, we kind of thought it was like, you know, we could just take this as a free pass, but right. we, we, we wouldn't sit well with it. So like, we, you're, we you're pay. too ethical for that. Yeah. So I go, and they're like, where's your waitress? Like, we don't know. And he's like, Oh, okay. You're one of the tables with, the, with you know, so-and-so she just left. We're not sure what's happening yet. We assume it's an emergency. I'm like, oh, I hope so. Otherwise she just quit, you know? <laughs> You had Gone Girl as the waitress. Yeah. So the next thing is, you know, we go to um, the grocery store mm-hmm. and we go to ring up the grocery store and, you know, we shop around and I, I just decide out of the blues, like, I, you know, I'm buying some fruit or whatever. I'm going to buy a coconut. <laughs> I've never bought a coconut. I've never just like snapped open a coconut or anything. And I'm like, I, I just want to do that. I've never done it. Let's go ahead and have some coconut fun. Well, you know, you have proven the old adage: when a man when a man wants a coconut, a man's got to have a coconut. Yeah. So I I get a coconut, fresh produce. You know, I grab that thing, <laughs> and I take it to the front. We're not even going to be coy about this. This is at a Walmart, uh-huh. which narrows it down to like the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, you know, I grab this, I grab this coconut. I'm like, I just want a coconut. This sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have to say, this is so you. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can literally, I mean, you are the type of person that would be in a Walmart and just have this bolt out of the blue and go, I want a coconut. Yeah, let's get a coconut. And we're not even like, we're buying some food. We're yeah. buying like other stuff. And I'm like, I want, I want a coconut. Well, the thing is, is that, is that you're the type of person that it doesn't have to necessarily be a, a, a coconut. I mean, it could be like yeah. out of nowhere you'd go, I want a can opener. Yeah. I want a duck. And yeah. I want and, a duck. I'll go out and get a duck. So I get this thing and, you know, now, the, would that be a live duck or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I want a live duck. I had, I had a, pet. do they sell live ducks at Walmart? Uh, that would. <laughs> Walmart would probably try and hire them. Yeah, yeah, you just set them loose. Yeah. I had a pet duck once. You but know, anyway, you, you don't have to pay them minimum wage, you know. I take this thing up to the front and uh <laughs> the first the first, you know, like it takes it takes forever just going through the line and we're just sitting there and I was like, let's not do checkout, let's have somebody do it because I had a lot of fresh produce and it's it's just faster. They they can enter that stuff faster than I can weigh it or whatever. Have you noticed how quickly this conversation went completely off the rails? <laughs> <laughs> it's is related it this is why I couldn't curl for okay. anyone who's still because who, of coconuts. For anyone who dozed off and is back awake, I take it up to the front, and she's like, "What's this?" <laughs> <laughs> They're like, "That's a coconut." She's like, "Oh, okay." She's like, "I, I wasn't sure. I thought it may be, but I, I wasn't sure." And I was like, "You sell them here." But anyway, I would like it's, this coconut. It's my small furry pet. And she's looking through all the sheets, trying to find out how you ring up a coconut. Like what, co- oh, what code the skew, is? What yeah. The skew is? Yeah. yeah, like what's the code for it? <laughs> Does it go by weight? Does it go by whatever? <laughs> and she's looking for like five minutes, and then she calls over one of the other one of the other cashiers, and they both are looking over their sheets, and like his line's backing up, her mm-hmm. line's backing up, and they're looking out like, and we seriously spent like five ten minutes just sitting there while they try to figure out what is a and how do you ring up a coconut. I and, have to say, I have lost all interest in Kerbal. <laughs> this story is so fascinating. If you want to shut down Walmart from the inside, buy a coconut. And so they eventually, like, <laughs> she, they both look at their lines, and then they look at me, and they just throw it in the bag and say, you can have it. Are you serious? Yeah, they just gave me the coconut. <laughs> and, you got a free coconut yeah, from Walmart. So I think I may just go in there every couple of weeks to just get my free coconut. I don't even, I haven't even like cracked this thing open. I don't even know if I like fresh coconut, but you yeah, might as well. <laughs> well, you know, from, we learned from Castaway, be sure and drill a hole in it and drink the coconut water. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not even sure I'm going to do this. Like I have power tools in my car, but like, I'm not sure if I should be like, I was also previously using them on drywall and like metal and mm-hmm, stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I have to properly clean my drill before I drill open this coconut. I don't know. There's so many questions, you know, it's like people have been opening these things for, you know, millions of years or something. Mm-hmm. And I haven't. So I'm not sure where to go with this thing. Watch Castaway. Yeah, modern day man with a coconut. Like I don't want to like just hammer it open and like lose lose all the the milk or whatever. The the delicious goodness. Yeah. So that's that's gonna be my weekend thing because I don't know how long a coconut lasts. I mean, it's in a hard shell. I mean, M and M's last a long time. They have a right, shell, right. but like a coconut, like when does it go bad? Who knows? Okay. Wal- Walmart doesn't know. Can can I summarize? But anyway, it took a lot of time. For all those things. And I didn't have time to curve so there you go. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to summarize. You ready? Yeah. Hey, Nas. Hey. What was your Kerbal progress this week? I got a free coconut. I got a free coconut. So if anyone asks, <laughs> how's your progress this week? And you don't have any progress, just say, I got a coconut. <laughs> Coconut nut is a giant nut. If you eat too much, you get very fat. Now she put the lime in the coconut. She drank a bowl. Ladies and gentlemen, so ends the greatest episode of Kerbal Cast ever. <laughs> that is too funny. So, what is your progress? Well, um, okay, a couple of things. Uh, I want to start with number one. I spent some time on Steam watching some other uh, people play. Yeah, and. Um, you know, the, you remember the whole, uh, you know, Rodney Dangerfield, W.C. Fields, the whole bit about, you know, I can't take this abuse much longer and I yeah. don't get any respect. Yeah. Yeah. That's me on Steam. <laughs> um, Jim3535 was playing. Yeah. Okay. And I was watching him and 
at the same time I was watching him, Free Toss popped up and he was, you know, hey, Biff, what's going on? So I had two conversations going simultaneously. I had Jim 35, 35. I was watching him yeah. and talking with him. And I was also chatting with Free Toss. And simultaneously, I cannot believe this, simultaneously, Jim 3535 says to me, you know, what amazes me about you and Nos is how difficult you make things. You guys come up <laughs> with the most absurd ways of doing things and, and you know, and you, you, you like overly complicate things and you make all these problems for yourselves. And I'm like, yeah, ha, ha, well, you know, we're learning and ha, ha. And right about this time, Free Toss goes, Hey, listen, um, I'm thinking about doing an episode of Flight Fundamentals with Rendezvous, but um, no offense, I'm not going to use your method because it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense and it's and it's hard to explain. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've got like stereo abuse going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. You know, and um, um, Fritas has started doing his Twitch stream. And, uh, and we were, uh, we were all watching it the other day and, and Amy was, uh, Amy K was part of the group and Amy has been asking questions about rendezvous. And I said to free toss, well, since my way makes no sense, yeah, you know, could you show, uh, Amy how to do rendezvous? And then Amy had to bail, but he was already in the process of doing rendezvous mm -hmm. and Ascalon was part of the group. And he said, how does Biff rendezvous that makes no sense? And I explained it. And then we watched Free Toss do it. And Ascalon said, isn't that the same way that Biff does it? The big difference. Um, yeah. And I think what makes my way kind of make no sense is they their method of rendezvous involves a lot of maneuver nodes. And I think that's what makes it make no sense to them mm -hmm. the way I do it. Because I tend not to do a lot of maneuver nodes. Yeah. Um. But, uh, but free toss showed us how to do rendezvous. Um, and, um, what was, what was fun about, uh, Jim 3535 was we were having this conversation and he was talking about, um, he said, well, I'm really tired because earlier today I went diving at the aquarium and I was like, I was unaware you could do such a thing. I, are you allowed to? Yeah. That's what <laughs> I, was, I was like. Can, can you do this? Yeah. And he, well, it turns out he works there. Oh, okay. And he was, you know, he was like in full diving equipment and he was cleaning the aquarium. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he, it was the sea bass aquarium. And of course me, you know, Austin Powers fan, right? Immediately had to say, were they mutated sea bass? They are mutated sea bass. Really? Ah. Well, he lets that one slide. He says, no, no. And he starts explaining what kind of bass they are. Sea bass. You yeah. know, they're this color and they're, they're, they're this genus and the whole bit. And I said, are they ill tempered? Absolutely. Well, that's a start. <laughs> and he just keeps going, like just completely yeah. ignoring me. And I said, well, who cleans the, the tank with the sharks with the laser beams on their head? And he was, well, you know, somebody else got to clean the shark tank this week. And, you know, and I, and I finally went, are you just going to ignore all of my Austin Bowers jokes? <laughs> and I, that's when I found out he was messing with me because he wrote back and he said, Austin Powers is not a joke. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we can account, we can, uh, in addition to real life pilots and people that work at NASA and people that intern at SpaceX and all of those folks, we can now count somebody that works at an aquarium. Not as, as somebody in our yeah. audience. So we have, we have a good audience, I think. Um, okay. So that was my steam progress as far as watching people. Uh, as far as playing goes, you remember we had a letter last week or week before where somebody suggested go get an asteroid and put it into curb and orbit. Oh yeah. And just mine it and mine it. Well, I haven't done, uh, asteroid rendezvous in a long time and asteroid rendezvous is very difficult. Yeah. But I targeted, the first time I did an asteroid rendezvous, I actually went for one of the bigger asteroids. And that's when I discovered that moving one of those suckers is not easy mm -hmm. because there's lots of mass. Yeah. And this was back before you could mine them for resources. Um, so this time I said, well, I'm going to go for a tiny asteroid. And you got to understand, in my mind, asteroids are just giant piles of minerals and resources just floating in space yeah you know they're like infinite they're like infinite 
uh, rocks full of nothing but fuel and resources and all kinds of goodies. Mm -hmm. So I go through this whole deal. I clamp onto an asteroid and I start drilling into it to refill my fuel tanks. And within about two seconds, I exhausted it. And I was like, you got to be kidding. How small is it? It was, it was tiny. I mean, it was literally, it was the one that, that, um, that if you, if you click on it, uh, in parentheses, cause they say what size it is in parentheses. Uh-huh. This one was the one that said tiny. Oh, okay. Um, and I really, when I first clamped onto it, um, what I thought was really cool is the minute you clamp onto it and deploy your drill, you get a window that shows you, um, how much resources are there. It tells you the percentage of the resources that you've drilled. Uh, it gives you actually a lot of information. And I thought when I clamped onto it, I thought, man, this is going to be just, this is going to be great. This is going to be the never ending bowl of, of, of goodies. Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, drained it in about two seconds. Yeah. Oh, come on. You know, it'd be interesting is if you could get more fuel out of it, mm-hmm. if you, uh, did a, like less purity. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's not an option. Yeah. At this stage. Yeah. It just, I don't know. It'd, it'd be interesting if you could yeah. do that. Like you would get less mileage out of it right. or something, but you could get more fuel. So if you needed to just disperse it into other kind of tanks or yeah. something else, you know, cut it with ethanol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or baby powder or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess that too. Yeah, that too. Um I thought it was really cool. When you approach an asteroid, um, you can right click on it and an option comes up where you can target the center of mass. Um one of the things that I had been concerned about was um, you know, because I designed a ship that was supposed to clamp onto an asteroid, and I thought if I'm gonna move this thing, if I clamp onto it at an odd angle. I'm going to be constantly fighting that imbalance, yeah. trying to get it back. Well, you can target the center of mass, and you can clamp onto that. And it, I mean, it literally, I mean, you have a nice balanced ship. So I didn't realize you could do that. But, yeah, when you approach an asteroid, right-click and target center of mass. One thing I have always been curious about in the game, what would happen if you brought an asteroid back and brought it into Kerbin Atmosphere? Yeah, actually, not since there's heat damage. It, yeah, like hmm. I've always wondered about that because you know, an a- even the tiny asteroids in the game in real life, if one of those came into Earth orbit, if one of those entered Earth atmosphere, mm-hmm. we'd be in some serious trouble. Yeah. So I was curious if the game had anything written into its code dealing with this. I thought, wouldn't it be funny if there was some kind of Easter egg or some little something in there? Yeah. Yeah. So I bring this thing. I, I did have, I had enough fuel to bring it back to Kerbin. And I had just enough fuel to bring the periapsis down low enough into the atmosphere. And when I say just enough fuel, I mean, I, by the time I brought this thing, I think I set my, I think when I was done, I think my periapsis was at 40 kilometer or 40,000 kilometers. Oh, wow. Um, but at that point, I had no RCS left and I had no fuel left. Okay. At that point, I was, you were dry. Yeah, I was totally dry. Um, I bring it into the atmosphere. Here's what happens. First time I bring it in, okay, and I get to the point where I've got flames and the whole bit, the game crashes. I did it again. I get to pretty much the same point, game crashes. Uh huh. And a part of me was thinking, I wonder if that's it. I wonder if that's the Easter egg that you bring the asteroid into Kerbin atmosphere, and yeah. because it's a quote-unquote extinction-level event, or as they said in the movie Deep Impact, Ellie, mm-hmm. I wonder if that's the Easter egg, that well, when you bring an asteroid in, it wipes out it the game. It destroys the Kerbal Space Program. Yeah, and I and I thought, I wonder if that's it. Yeah. And then I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, probably not because the game crashing, if that was intentional... It would be so subtle, it would be difficult to differentiate between an intentional crash uh-huh. and just the game crashing. Yeah. And so I couldn't see the game designers going, hey, if someone ever brought an asteroid back, let's make the game crash. You know, because that's not the kind of thing that stands out as an Easter egg. Mm-hmm. What I could see them doing was like, for example, the game freezes and like a text box pops open and says, congratulations, you just wiped out every kerbal on the planet yeah you know that would be like a definitive easter egg or Mm -hmm. something so i said well okay i'm going to give this a third shot i'm going to try it a third time 
And this time it came all the way down and did not crash. So that, that holds up my theory that that was not the, the previous crashes were not Easter eggs. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, and I'm not positive about this. This is me speculating. I think the game doesn't know what to do with an asteroid in atmosphere. Yeah. And the reason I say that is when I brought this tiny asteroid all the way in, uh, I just happened to land in the ocean. As soon as I hit the water, as you would expect, my ship went goodbye Mm -hmm. because that happens. Yeah. What I ended up with was a floating asteroid. (laughs) And what? I and I tweeted out a picture of this. Yeah. Because I was like, huh? An asteroid that floats? Well, you drilled so many holes in it, it was like a sponge now. I guess so. Well, but I mean, there's holes in bowling balls and they don't float. <laughs> but yeah, here's this, you know, and it's not sitting, it wasn't shallow water, so I know it wasn't sitting on the bottom, you know, with part of it sticking up. I mean, it was literally floating in the water. Mm-hmm. I think the game may be coded in such a way that it doesn't know what to do with asteroids. So it treats it like a ship part. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, but yeah, if you bring an asteroid back, uh, it will float, strangely enough. Yeah. Anyway, so my next, the next thing that I'm going to do, uh, is I'm going to go for a bigger asteroid and see if I can get more fuel out of it. Um, when, when I exhausted the tiny one before I even brought it back to Kerbin, that kind of eliminated the whole idea of bringing one back and putting it in orbit as a space, you know, as a space gas station. Mm -hmm. Um, Apparently, I have my own floating island now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> go put a flag on it. Go <laughs> put a flag on it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so that was my progress for the week. I spent a lot of time. Um, I spent a lot of time getting this asteroid back. Uh, it took me three tries to get it down to the ground. Yeah. And I spent some time on Steam being absolutely abused. <laughs> Oh, uh, also, I did want to mention, um, as I, as I said before, Steam, uh, or not Steam, Free Toss is now doing a Twitch stream. Yeah. And, um, and I strongly encourage folks to log in and watch, um, a lot of good information there. Uh, it's, especially if you're following the Free Toss Flight Fundamentals, um, because you can actually watch him do video wise what you're hearing audio wise. So anyway, check him out. Free toss. I think it's free toss seven. I think so. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, do you know how people talk about us being celebrities? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Here's proof that we are not celebrities. (laughs) This is absolute proof. When free toss did his second Twitch stream, Mm -hmm. um, I logged in and I was like, Hey, free toss. And he was like, Hey, you're the only person here. You're my one and only viewer. I've been, you know, for the first couple of minutes, he was streaming to nobody. Yeah. And I, and I, and I log in and he goes, okay, great. Now I got, you know, one guy. Yeah. Biff is here. I'm doing it for a reason. So I immediately get on, uh, our Kerbalcast email list and I email everybody and I say, free toss is on Twitch right now. You know, let's get him an audience, log in and watch. And I also got on Twitch, not Twitch. I got on Twitter, Twitter and Twitch. Yeah. I'm too old. I can't keep these straight. <laughs> but I got on Twitter and I said, Hey, everybody, Free Toss is on Twitch. You know, log in. He's doing hover jets and, you know, he's doing rendezvous and, you know, you, you, you let's, let's help him get an audience. Everybody log in and watch Free Toss. Okay. Well, celebrity that I am. Do you know what that translates into? What? He had a max audience at his peak. His audience was seven people. Hey. So my quote unquote celebrity, if you need eyeballs for your Twitch stream, old Biff can bring up to six people with him. We got that minivan. Yeah. Now compare that to like Dos Valdez. Yeah. Dos Valdez could do a Twitch stream for an hour where he sits on a toilet and picks his nose and he'd have 30,000 viewers. It's good. Hey, it's good Twitch. Yeah. It's good television. Well, and, and if he actually pulled his pants down, then he would have like even more viewers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you come, know, come for the nose. I, I thought we were trying to get him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm complimenting him. Yeah. I'm yeah. 30,000 people want to watch him sitting on a toilet picking his nose. No, seriously. But I mean, you know, my quote unquote celebrity 
is like the most people I could bring in and understand. I appreciate everybody that logged in, but at the same time, I was thinking, uh huh. Yep. This the, is, yeah. this is old celebrity Biff here. Yeah, don't have, don't have as much pull as you thought. Yeah. It's, I, that's more people than have watched me on Steam. So. Oh, really? Yeah. I think the most I've had is like four or five. What I think is so funny is because you're the novice player. Yeah. And I'm, I'm by no means I'm I'm not an expert, but I have spent a lot of time in the game and I've done a lot of things in the game. Um I find it hilarious the difference between the way they react to you and the way they react to oh, me. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm like Well, the... with you it's like, you know, Nos, you know, it's like it's okay. We know you don't know what yeah. you're doing. Lovable and... idiot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like Forrest Gump. Yeah. Me, well, on the other yeah. hand, I'm like Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> you're getting everything wrong, and yeah. your rendezvous makes no sense. And and I got ice cream. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan, ice cream, <laughs> ice cream. Well, I think that wraps it up for us. You don't want me to make reference to my Lieutenant Dan magic legs? No. No? No. Are you sure? <laughs> uh, I, I could. You could. I that could. Is, that doesn't mean you should. I could. Hey. I'll be your shrimp and boat first mate. You know, there's all kinds of ways you can explode. Space plane explosions. Uh Uh-huh. Rocket explosions. Uh Uh-huh. You know what I think? Hovercraft explosions. I think you're desperately trying to move on. I'm desperately trying to move on. Okay, well, let's move on. First stage expended. Second stage. The mission briefing. And that means your letters and tweets. Go ahead and start us off. Okay, uh, first letter comes to us from Ron K. Although he signs the letter R, uh, which makes me think it... I, I think it's a pirate. Yeah, I think it was brought to us by the letter R. The letter R. Now, one word you can make with the letter R is the word ROLL. See, I like the pirate. R, mateys, I be playing Kerbal. Uh, Ron K, or R, uh, says... With the release of version 1.0 and the new avionics, I've been having a lot of trouble getting a viable design for my space planes. In the good old days, all you had to do was slap some wings, an air intake, and an engine onto a fuel tank, and you'd be in orbit in a jiffy. Not my experience with space planes, but okay. (laughs) Uh, But that's not the case now. Since the release of version 1.0, I had gone through about a dozen space plane designs but couldn't find anything dependable. Rockets are fine, but in KSP, I want my wings. I was really getting worried, and even after a big push in career mode to get enough science to acquire aero spike and rapier engines, I was still having no luck. It got so bad, I was even considering changing my name to Biff. (laughs) Well, you would have moved up the alphabet, at least, from R to B. Uh, it wasn't until I changed my entire line of thinking that I was finally able to make something that met my needs. The trick was to take advantage of the fact jets, the fact jets and Nerva engines. Do you know what that is? No. Okay. Uh, take advantage of the fact jets and fact jets. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I stop? I was rolling. I was doing fine. And then now I'm going fact jets, fact jet. Fact jets and Nerva engines only use liquid fuel, so balancing liquid fuel and oxidizer is much less important. Using a multi-type engine configuration of turbojets, rapier engines, and nuclear engines made it work. This means during the early and late stages of your ascent to orbit, you are using liquid fuel, and it is only between 25,000 meters and 60,000 meters that you need to use the rapier engines with oxidizer in rocket mode. The Nervas give you the final push into orbit, leaving enough fuel for a powered descent and landing. Perfect. With six air intakes, four pre-coolers, two turbojets, two rapiers, two Nerva nuclear engines, and a partridge in a pear tree, the resulting... De- Your addition? That was my addition. <laughs> uh, the resulting design looks like a bit of a brute, but it gets the job done. I can also switch out the central section for a cargo bay or passenger cabins if I choose. I am very pleased, but I will miss those small, elegant space planes I used to orbit in the old days. Sigh. Always remember the inspiring words of President John F. Kerbin. We pledge to send a Kerbal to the Mun and return him safe-ishly 
to Kerbin in this decade? R. R. Uh, R, I would recommend free toss flight fundamentals for space planes. Seriously, I, yeah. I, I have learned so much. And yeah, this is from I, somebody who doesn't even like space planes. Yeah, he's the go-to guy for space plane advice. He's the go-to guy. Uh, let's see. Next letter is... From Acronymous. Hey, guys. Here I am writing again. As I listened to the last episode, I noticed a minor detail. You said Christoph Err when you accidentally said my name. It's actually spelled without the E-R. No hard feelings, though, as this gives me a reason to write, you guys. Like Christoph Waltz? Yeah. Okay. The last cast made me also play a lot more somehow, which resulted in me doing my first successful moon cra- or, uh, landing in career. <laughs> and then I started modding. So far, there are 20 to 30 mods installed, and the list just keeps growing. Oh, my God. I started to frequently just browse the KSP forms for stuff that seems interesting, which led me to a very nice set of mods that just fit quite right for me. Although I now have to search some for some conflict that causes the game to crash on trying to recover a landed probe. Fly safe and try not to crash the game. Acronymous. That's cool. Saturday Night Live does a wicked impersonation of Christoph Waltz. So now anytime anyone says Christoph, I immediately think of them. Heart, heart, wink, and point! Okay, uh, the next thing we have, this was a post that uh, was on the KSP subreddit. And it was called, Dear Squad, this is not the game I wanted. And this was posted by Likes What I Do. Uh, I asked him if he didn't mind if we read it on the podcast, and he said absolutely. And uh, I asked DK, with his dulcet tones, to read the post for us. So here's DK reading a post by Likes What I Do called Dear Squad, This Is Not The Game I Wanted. I bought this game because I wanted to build spaceships. I wanted to fly my spaceship through space, shooting down other spaceships on my way to explore other planets. I booted it up and found my spaceship center waiting for me. Build a rocket, a capsule, fuel, engine. I sent it to the launch pad and spent the next 20 minutes pushing buttons trying to figure out how to get it to go. Well, I thought, this is silly. Maybe I'll try the other one I got. Space Engineers. I promptly set this boring simulator with its lame graphics aside. I started playing around in Space Engineers, learning the game, but my mind kept wandering back to that rocket simulator. I've never been so lost in a game before. Why don't I get it? It was just sitting there and I couldn't do anything. I logged off and went to sleep that night feeling dumb and confused. I awoke the next morning determined. I searched my library for that rocket game, Kerbal Space Program. There that green bastard was. I looked up the key binding list. Now I had it all figured out. SAS on, throttle up, launch. Hey, this is kind of cool. Look at that little green guy. He is loving it. That was two years ago. I remember when I was a kid, I had this book about asteroids. It talked all about asteroids, comets, and meteors. I loved that book so much, and I would bring it to school with me and read it instead of the textbook. I didn't even remember that until I started playing KSP. I am now a grown-up, and I work as a land surveyor. I convinced all the drafters in my office to try out the demo. Now we have to come to work an hour early just to talk about what we did in KSP the last night, or what neat new features are coming in the next update, or what cool new mod somebody made. And I still don't get out of the door in time. It has been like that for a solid year now. I now find myself thinking of things I would think about when I was a kid, when I had a book about asteroids. I know which planets are visible when I go outside at night now. A good portion of my day consists of checking NASA and ESA updates online. I have watched so many documentaries and read so many books about space travel, I think I could write my own. A few months ago, my mother, who lives in Florida, fell ill, but is since doing much better. I visited her a couple weeks ago and had the best idea. Hey, Mom, remember when you took me to Kennedy Space Center when I was a kid? Let's go again. We got to see them break ground on their new attraction, Heroes and Legends, and it turned out to be an absolutely unforgettable day. The people at KSC called me out as a KSP player within an hour, and we got to spend some time with a few of the engineers. My mom was pretty impressed with some of the conversations we had. Two years ago, I wanted a game where I could build a spaceship and shoot lasers out of it. Instead, I got all of this. So, squad... Thank you. And DK, thank you. Talk about an awesome voice. Yeah. 
Uh, I do want to. I do want to give DK a plug. By the way, he is Twitch streaming again. Yeah, he is. And it's really fun to watch. I mean, this is somebody who knows what he's doing, and he is so entertaining. Mm-hmm. Uh, check out it's it's DK Declarations. Um, check him out on Twitch if you have not already. Uh, I am following him, uh, and so anytime DK Dos Valdez or Free Toss starts Twitch streaming. I get a notification. Yeah. And so I can log in and watch. Uh, thank you, DK, for reading that. Uh, that post was to the KSP subreddit by likes what I do. And it was called Dear Squad. This is not the game I wanted. I, one of the things about Kerbal that I absolutely love is how many times have we heard this story? Yeah. That it like completely changed people's perspective on things yeah. or like, like gave them a new direction in life that they want to pursue. How many times have you heard me tell you that this is that if I had been a kid, I mean, this is the game I've wanted my whole life. Yeah. And I, I, I didn't really realize that until I got the game, which is the mark of a good idea. The mm-hmm. minute you get something and you realize this is what I wanted all along, that's the mark of a good idea. Yeah. But I like the idea that somebody who was very interested in this stuff was able to come to a game and this just this just scratches that itch. I also love the thing of, that he talks about the asteroid book. A, did you ever have a book like that when you were a kid that you just loved to death to the point where like the bindings were falling apart because you just you just you read that thing so much. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I I had a couple little books like that. There were those. They were like large white um science books or mm-hmm. like they would be about bugs or they'd be about you know just all sorts of different things yeah or like cross sections of like ships yeah. stuff like that i uh I, I will say kerbal uh has attracted a very good audience i think mm-hmm. because when you look at it i mean seriously we as we were talking about it earlier uh our audience the the intelligence level and the skill level is just phenomenal it's off the charts yeah, this is Kerbal is a very unique game. And I the thing that struck me was, you know, one of what's the first thing he said? I was looking for a spaceship game where I could shoot lasers. There yeah. aren't there aren't any. Yeah, lasers. like all the stuff you'd normally get in a lot of space games, like flying around, shooting, shooting lasers at other ships and stuff. It doesn't have that. Yeah, it's got a lot more. It just doesn't have that thing. And you quickly realize that you don't really need that thing to have a good time. No. No, well, I mean, this is the most challenging game I've ever played. Um, and it's more challenging to me than, for example, an online first person shooter is mm-hmm. because there it's all based on quick reactions. I mean, here it's thinking your way through the problem. And sometimes the problem when you first approach it seems monumental. Yeah. But you think your way through it. And when you do finally come up with the answer, it's so much more rewarding because it wasn't a matter of, you know, I click the trigger a millisecond faster than somebody else. It's a matter of, I thought my way through a problem. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm, maybe I'm overthinking it, <laughs> but anyway, um, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate DK for reading the letter. I appreciate, uh, likes what I do for the post. And, uh, and again, I do want to say thank you to squad for such an awesome game keeps me out of the strip clubs yeah <laughs> i remember that yeah because you know if it wasn't for kerbal you'd be there i'd be at the strip you know, clubs. It's one or the other there aren't a lot of other things you could do yeah, there's nothing in between uh next letter comes to us from our good friend jay arthur who by the way uh will be with us later in the program um, we had uh, asked in the uh, in previous programs uh, if anyone could help us with mining and Jay Arthur has responded with a mining tutorial, and uh, we'll get to that in uh, just a few minutes, but let's go ahead and do his letter. Um, this is called Mining for Profit, in response to Biff and Nas's questions. Jay Arthur, you can absolutely use mining to make money in KSP in the way you described. Do you remember what he's talking about? Yeah. You were talking about... Yeah, if you could set up a, like, send an empty a ship that was mostly empty, fill it up with fuel and bring it back for money. Yeah. Uh, Jay Arthur says, I did exactly that on a career playthrough. I had mining colonies set up on Minmus, the Mun, and on Kerbin. It's very difficult to make money this way at first, but essentially 
you do just what you said. Send up space planes or rockets that are as empty as possible and send them back to the Space Center as full as possible. You do have to come back to the Space Center, though. Uh, I, re I remember you had questioned whether or not you had to do that. Yeah, you could just bring the ship back or if you had to pilot it back. Uh, he says, as, uh, you have to, you have to come back to the space center as just recovering the vessel on the planet returns a smaller percentage of funds back to you. Landing on the runway gives you a hundred percent back. Or as we've determined on the grass next to the runway, which is a much bigger target. Yeah. Uh, meaning that you can do this to make the most money. You can also return just ore. Since it occupies a smaller volume than fuel, you can send smaller ships thereby saving on cost that way. You remember I said when I found out, you know, you don't you don't gain or lose anything on mass, but you do with volume. Uh -huh. And I said somebody smarter than me will figure out the advantage. Yeah. J. Arthur. There you go. He's smarter than me. Or, however, is not worth as much as refined fuel. So it's a bit of a trade-off. If you remember a few weeks ago, I sent you guys a letter talking about the Kerbal Mining Guild. Uh, this is exactly what I've done with that career game. Biff, the advantage to launching a ship full of ore into orbit is to save volume, mass, and cost on launching and refueling something in orbit. Let's say, for example, that you want to build an interplanetary ship. So, you launch piece after piece up to orbit and assemble the vessel. One of the pieces you previously launched was a refinery module. Now, for your last launch... Send your mining lander with full ore tanks. When it gets there, you have ore that your onboard module can refine to fuel to finish topping off your tanks, rather than sending up another launch just to refuel everything. You can also do this to save on refueling stations in orbit, even at Kerbin, as the launch of a reusable ore tank is more cost-effective over time than disposable or even reusable fuel tanks, as the volume capacity of the fuel tank lowers the overall cost of launching into orbit. Do this with a space plane, and you get even greater cost savings due to how cheap they are to run anyway. Um, Homer to your mobile, J. Arthur. And like I said, he will be giving us a tutorial. Uh, we're going to get to it here in just a few letters, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to read his letter also, um, because uh, he knows a lot about mining, obviously. Yeah. And we're about to learn a whole lot more. <laughs> What's the next letter? This one comes from Carlos C. Hi, Biff, Nos, and any potential guests, including Amy. Uh, this letter is actually mostly for her. I already forwarded this to, to Amy. Oh, did you? Yeah. I'd like to thank Freetas for his flight fundamentals, especially the Thunderdome edition. I've been building space planes for a long time, but I wasn't getting the trick in 1.0. In short, I thought I should avoid the plane of fire effect. When I learned that all flames are kind of normal, my planes did... Uh, again, get to space. I felt so so happy that well, even fell in the debt as I have no as I have no idea how to help you. I decided to try to help Amy and potentially all these people that are struggling to dock. First of all, I would like to point that docking is as hard as as is balanced to your ship. So if your ship isn't balanced, you're gonna have a hard time. When trying to build something, the easiest way to ensure good maneuverability is to distribute RCS equidistant and symmetric to the center of mass and take into account how that center varies when fuels are deployed. Also, set as target the docking port you want to dock, not just the ship. You can do this by right-clicking the dock in the other ship. Usually, usually you have to be close enough and preferably moving slow. For every Mac user, also take into account that there is a precision mode in the controls. Windows users can use it by pressing BLOQ, MAY, but if you're on Mac, you should map it, at least it was my case. Precision mode will allow you to make much more fine adjustments in docking, taking away a little bit of that left, 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 no right, right, left. Ah! <laughs> Take into account that we need uh, two kinds of moves, rotation and translation. That means look in the same angle as the other docking port and get them together. Also, camera alignment and references are very useful, if not mandatory. When things go south, I usually try to align axis independently. That means perfectly align one axis, full stop, and then align the second one. And then imperfectly try to approach. That's really useful and possible as long as your ship is well balanced. Otherwise, triangle will become, again, from hard to, well, you got it. Ah, and docking is, is really easier if you can see. Try to do it in direct sight of the sun. If everything else fails, or if you just want it, I would recommend one of these two mods. They really help you to get more data in order to dock. 
Navball Docking Alignment Indicator or Docking Port Alignment Indicator. With Navball Docking, things will go pretty easy. You'll get a red marker on the Navball. You only ahem, need to align the marks. Pink for the target dock, yellow for prograde, red for rotation. Second, yeah, very nice lessons, but I already tried and didn't get anything working. What about a little real help? Well, uh, he has a craft file that he was giving us. Hopefully, if you guys uh, add it to the links. But what if you guys read it and didn't link it? I guess we'll get a laugh about it. At least I will. More more than usual, I mean. Well, maybe we will. Maybe we won't, Carla. Deal with it. <laughs> I made, oh, we're back to Gamergate, yeah. are we? <laughs> I made this rocket thinking about Amy, but used only stock parts just in case anyone else wants to use it. It cost about 90 k but Amy, allow me to uh, advise even real astronauts get thousands of hours of practice before they have the chance to mess with real expensive breakable stuff i know you want to do everything in a career but a little bit of sandbox to check a concept or train something is not a bad idea amy i know you use remote tech you should add a a reflection dp10 antenna at least in case you don't want explosions maybe you want explosions who knows also i think docking is a really basic skill so i included there here the ascent stage and did a profile for any of you and uh, he lists the profile, but there's a lot of numbers and a lot of things, <laughs> and a lot of symbols. Numbers, bad. He says, it's not test and fairing, but I'm confident it will work. Anyway, you can always throw away the ascent stage and use only the docking drones as you wish. I would really love to send you more things, even if they were only to encourage you. Uh, this is a great moment to remind about the Patreon. Uh, it is. Yeah. Patreon.com slash Kerbalcat. Yeah. <laughs> the last six months, we, uh, when Nas describes how busy he is, I would totally change myself for him. I played about six hours since 1.0, and the last one was making this rocket. I'll debate that. We'll see. Well, boys, keep up the good work with Kerbalcast. Seriously, you're doing great, and I love it. So a big thank you to Carlos C. He, he wants to change places with you. What do you think? Would you, that be? You, you're trying to take my spot? Would that be an upgrade? I've been working here for a year. To get this spot in Kerbal Cat. No, I think he wants your life. Oh. Not your spot on... See, yeah. you know what it is? You can keep the spot on Kerbal Cast. He just wants everything else. Oh, everything else? All right, let me talk to my girlfriend and, and, and see what happens. You know, if she agrees to this, that should tell you yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Then, then that means I should agree to the change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know when he was talking about the left, left, no right, no left? Yeah, it's like you know Amy K's thing. Yeah, that's yeah. What, that was a reference to this. Do you know what I would like to do? What you just said, I would like to take that and add a disco track to it. I think I would have a hit single. You know, because it would be, doom, 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 and it'd be like, up, down, backwards, forwards, up, down, quit. Up a bit, down a bit, slower, do it. no, faster, slower, up, down, ah, quit. Up a bit, up a bit, up a bit. Up a bit, quit, quit, quit. Down a bit, down a bit, down a bit. Quit, quit, quit. Faster, slower, faster, slower, faster, slower. Up, down, ah, quit, ah, quit, ah, quit. Faster, slower, faster, slower, faster, slower. Up, down, quit, ah, quit, ah, quit, ah, quit, quit. Oh, that is terrible, isn't it? Any excuse I can to you know blow the dust off of that and bring it out. Amy was, that was from when Amy was, uh, sat in for you. Yeah, this is the first time I think she sat in. Yeah, and I asked yeah. her, I said, describe your rendezvous, and that's what she came up with. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought it was just hilarious and turned it into a disco track. So, if you notice that even when Amy's not on the program, we talk about Amy. Yeah, she's on the program even when she's not on the program. She, um, um, she's been on Twitter this week and she talked about how she's gone to, uh, what is it? She's gone to Duna, and now she wants to go to Jewel. And she was talking about trying to figure out a way to do it, to build a ship big enough to do it and come back without rendezvous. And I asked her, I said, why are you trying to avoid rendezvous? And she said, because I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. And she said, I'm horrible at it. And uh, DK chimed in, and he said, well, I'm sure you were horrible the first time you tried to land on the Mun, but that didn't stop you. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of what's that's what's led to this whole thing where we're trying to um, teach Amy Rendezvous. Mm-hmm. That, so. That's kind of where I sat with Rendezvous, and since I have to restart career so mm-hmm. often, mm-hmm. it's um, just kind of stay that I'll get to it eventually, but right now it's like you're. I'm trying to figure out career and getting to the Mun and career and all that. Rendezvous used to be the most difficult thing in the game for me. Yeah. And now I do it and almost not think about it. Mm-hmm. Isn't that weird? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's like whatever big obstacle, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, rendezvous used to be the thing that, you know, I, I always knew that any time I had to do a rendezvous, I just almost blocked out a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. And now I just, you know, time to rendezvous. Boom. Yeah. Knock, knock it out in a couple minutes. Well, let's learn about uh, mining. Uh, as I mentioned, Jay Arthur uh, is is uh, doing a mining tutorial for us. And this is part one. Welcome to the Kerbal Mining Guild. This series of tutorials will guide new members through the process of learning how to mine, transport, and refine ore from almost any celestial body in the Kerbal system, as well as some advanced tutorials on asteroid capture and mining, mining for profit, and a self-sustaining ship. In our first tutorial, we'll be covering the bare essentials you need to know in order to get an understanding of how mining works in KSP. Please note that this tutorial only covers stock mining mechanics. In an advanced episode, we will be discussing how various mods can add to the mining experience. For now, though, let's get down to the basics. In KSP's 1.0 update, Squad introduced resource mining into the game as a way for players to have new experiences, challenges, and ways to play the game. In order for the mining experience to be fully enjoyed, we must first go over what it really added to the game piece by piece. Number 1. Ore. Ore was added to the game as a resource like fuel or electricity. This is what you mine to be refined in the various fuels that your crafts use in KSP. It's on every celestial body in the game in infinite quantities, except for asteroids, which have finite quantities, as well as the sun and jewel, which can't be landed on, so they have no quantities. Each time you create a new game, you have the ability to set the abundance of resources to a value ranging from 10 to 120%. Any save games that you have carried over after the update to 1.0 will have the default value of 100% set. Ore is also randomly distributed throughout the bodies, meaning that no two games will have the same concentration of ore in the same places. Number 2. Scanners. There are three scanners that can be used to make drilling for ore something a bit more precise than just guessing where it will be and poking the ground. First, there is the M700 survey scanner. This large satellite is used to scan an entire body for resources. It will give you a breakdown of how much of every resource is on a body. This includes things like ore, water, and minerals. It also will show any modded resources you've added into your game. This information can be viewed from the tracking station when you select the body in question. When you do this, the scanning data can also be seen overlaid onto the body, so that you can see where the highest concentrations of resources are. One final benefit to this scanner is that when you scan a body, you receive a small amount of science for doing so. The second scanner is the M4435. This scanner operates on a much smaller scale than the M700, but does essentially the same thing. The key difference between the two is the M4435 can only scan what's directly below it. The third scanner is the surface scanner. It serves the same purpose as the other scanners, but can only be used from the ground or a very low altitude. It has the added benefit of taking detailed scans, which can be used to further refine data on your orbital resource projections. Each of these scanners will be discussed in more detail in a future episode, where we'll really get into how and when to most effectively use them. Number 3. Holding Tanks There are two sizes of holding tanks to contain the ore that you mine. One comes in the 1.25 meter size, and the other comes in the 2.5 meter size. The 1.25 meter tank holds 300 units of ore, and the 2.5 meter tank holds 1,500 units of ore. We will discuss potential pros and cons of each later, but for now, those are the only differences worth noting. Number four, the drill. There is only one drill in KSP, the Drillomatic Mining Excavator, and it does exactly what the name says. It drills and excavates ore. There is some advanced skill involved with the drill for a future tutorial. However, for the time being, all you need to know about it is that it needs to point towards the ground and be close enough to it to reach it. Number five, the ISRU. ISRU is a real-world acronym that stands for In Situ Resource Utilization, which is shorthand for, hey, it's too expensive to take all this junk with us. How can we make it when we get there? It actually refers to more things in the real world than just fuel, but for our purposes, all this converter does is make liquid fuel, oxidizer, and monopropellant. It will not convert directly from a drill, so you need to have ore tanks feeding it from somewhere. They can either be connected directly to the ISRU, or through docking ports in the case of an orbiting station or multi-part ground base. Now that you have a basic understanding of how all of these new systems work, there are a couple of other things worth noting before we wrap up. The first is that mining is a late game skill. You get the basic stuff by researching advanced science tech, which is in the second to last research column. It may be good for you to practice these concepts in sandbox mode, where you won't have to worry about investing time to research and unlock them. The second is that mining is one of the deepest and most challenging activities in the game to master. It is true that anyone can just go and mine and refuel their ship, but if you really take the time to learn and perfect the mining system, you can completely change the way you play the game. 
I don't want to get too ahead of myself though, so we'll get into that in the future. For now, make sure you take a good, long shower. We're about to get dirty. I'll see you in part two of the Kerbal Mining Guild orientation series, where we'll discuss assembling and using your first miner. Until then, J. Arthur, signing off. We're about to get dirty. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get your hands dirty if you want to get something out of the soil. So. You know, uh, ever since he told me he was going to do the mining tutorial, I've had two songs going through my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've already heard one, 16 tons. Yeah, and the other one, working in a coal mine. Working in the coal mine. Yeah. That's the other one. <laughs> and it's, uh, which version of it in, in your head? Um, Me, it's Devo. Oh, Devo? Yeah. Oh, no. Remember? Do you remember the very first heavy metal movie? Came back, uh, yeah. what was it, uh, early 80s? Yeah. They had a song on the heavy metal soundtrack. It was Devo doing Working in a Coal Mine. Oh. I don't think I've heard that version. You've never heard that? No, I've heard like the original. Okay. Or whatever, like and the... I think there's a country version of it. I think, wasn't it the Judds did a version of it? No, I don't know. Okay. Maybe. maybe. Well, anyway, the one I've got is the Devo, you know. You've <laughs> been working in a coal mine going down, down. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I have. I, I don't even know anymore. I don't know what's real. Get get thee to YouTube and look up the Devo <laughs> working in a coal mine. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I have the next letter. Uh, yeah. Again, thank you to J. Arthur. Uh, I am looking forward to part two of this tutorial, and yes, I'm ready to get my hands dirty. Mining, um, now that they've added it to the game, uh, I've said before, uh, I, I really do feel like it changes the dynamic of the game. Yeah. I still, I haven't done it yet because I've been messing around with other stuff. I still want to do a planet hopping mission where I literally go planet to planet and get the resources I need as I go. Mm -hmm. um, I have yet to do it, but that's on, that's on my list after I float a couple of more asteroids. Yeah. Um, this next letter, uh, I wanted to bring this uh, to everyone's attention. Uh, this comes to us from Jeb Knows All, and he's having a technical issue. And the reason I brought this onto the show is I went online, and it turns out some other people are having the same technical issue as well. And I have not been able to find a solution. So I'm curious if anyone else has run into this problem and if they've run into a solution so we can help Jeb Knows All. Let me go ahead and read the letter. And uh, and he doesn't start with the technical issue, but we get to it fairly quickly. Uh, from Jeb Knows All. Listening to your show while I write this, specifically episode 10, been working on rendezvous and docking. It has been very hard, and I would like to find a way to make it easier. Second, I am stuck on 0 0.25. I would like any help with the update. I have tried the patcher and the launcher, but neither works. I give permission for crew report, but please use my username and send me an email because I am so far behind. Thank you. Uh, and I do have his email, um, so if you respond to us, uh, I can pass it on. Um, he sent me a further email. Uh, it's the error log, and it says, Error, SSL, certificate verify, failed. From what it sounds like, um, he bought the game specifically through Squad, not through Steam. Yeah, and the problem he's having is is that it will not update past point two five. There are other people that have bought the game through Squad and are having the exact same issue and the exact same error log. Hmm. My suggestion to him was completely delete the game, download a fresh copy, and install it. And yeah. he says that has not solved the problem. Oh, really? So anyway, if anyone has had this issue and you have a solution. Please let us know, and we will pass it on, and uh, hopefully Jeb knows all. We'll know what it's like to play 1.0. Yeah. <laughs> What's our next letter? This one comes from the awesome power of rockets. Yay! A purple space monster ate of my dreams of conquest. Biff. Are you going to read the letter? Yeah. That was the title. Oh, that was the title? Yeah. Oh, I so thought you were just page. randomly talking about <laughs> coconuts again. Biff, Nos, it's a good thing I'm not playing in Kettlewell mode because I have two skilled pilots stuck on a purple hell. Eef. I built twin craft equipped with wide landing legs, mining gear, and a pot at ground level. The harvester was to stay on the surface and refill the tanks from the rocket on top. Landing was gentle. Everything worked right on the way down. Egress and ingress were problem-free, and the mining rig did its job. 
Unfortunately, my design was severely flawed. Sure, it had the thrust-to-weight ratio in excess of 1.6 on Kerbin, but the ascent craft was horribly underpowered and just fell over on launch from Eve's lowlands. It's a good thought I'm a practicing coward, because I was able to revert and bring the two lady pilots back from their untimely ends. I don't know how other people manage to return from Planet Graveyard, because my launch pad has a tendency to collapse under the weight of the heavier ships that I've built, even with the launch clamps. I'm planning on going back for them, or at the very least set up an outpost and send some Kerbals to keep them company. Oh well, at least I don't have to worry about making soil or tinkering with hydrazine. The awesome power of rockets. Jim3535, when I was talking to him on Steam, um, one of the things he was talking about when he said that, you know, we overcomplicate things and, and whatever, he says, he said one of the things that amazes him was how I keep plinking away at Eve. And he says, because you just never seem to grasp how difficult Eve is. And I'm like, oh, I I fully understand it. Yeah, it's just the way you present it is funny. But Yeah. Um, He sent me a picture of an Eve lander slash ascent rocket. Uh This thing is huge. I'm looking at this going, oh, my God. Yeah. And he's going, this is what you need to get on and off of Eve. And I'm just shaking my head because, I mean, I have yet to send anything too even back, even remotely at that scale. Yeah. So, amazing. Wow. Well, it's like I said before, um, Eve is like my benchmark. Anytime I learn something new or anytime something new comes into the game, uh, I have a tendency to immediately try to apply it to Eve. Uh, and I think that's, I think the reason that I have so many failed attempts on Eve is because it's part of my learning curve. The minute squad introduced resource gathering, you know, I immediately tried to integrate that into, okay, how would this work when faced with Eve? Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's where I get into. Uh, let's see. Our next letter, uh, comes to us from Stephen D. Question time and success report. Hey, Biff and Noss. So 20 plus hours into the real game after some demo time and Jeb and Bob are stuck on the mun intentionally to complete a contract i'll get them later and i completed a 20 second rendezvous with no rcs that is difficult but as you guys say the sense of achievement in this game is great thanks for the tidbits to make it possible question when building rockets do you plan launch vehicle and payload separate or do you build a new beast every time i was contemplating this today As a career mode player, moving through the tech tree and having to make funds available, I'm forever designing different craft. But now I'm thinking that a solid launch vehicle would save enormous amounts of time. Well, if you can fly it reasonably well. Keep up the good work and a serious thank you to you both. I'm not necessarily a gamer, but the way you've been so welcoming has blown me away. So thanks. May you always have a star to steer by and enough fuel to get you home. Uh, again, that is Stephen D. Um, since you are primarily a career player, I'm going to throw that at you. Uh, do you plan your launch vehicle and payloads separately? Do you do something new every time, or do you like for? I have things that I give repeat business to. Right. You know, if I have like a rocket that works for a certain, like uh, actually the example from the previous two um episodes whenever i was launching uh and doing the vip tours Mm -hmm. i always had the same thing i had that saved i think i'm answering this question right i always had that rocket (laughs) saved and i would reuse it right and uh, every now and then i'd make a tweak if like hey i could do a part test while i'm doing this thing i'd Mm -hmm. add that part take away that part things like that so i think that's what the question was and i Mm -hmm. think that's how i answered it but yeah i always i always i reuse stuff all the time yeah yeah I like to, part of what I enjoy in the game, um, I, I love the whole space part of it, but, but there is a lot of, um, I get a lot of entertainment and a lot of satisfaction out of constantly building new ships and flying them. Yeah. Sometimes even building a ship and flying it with really no intention of doing anything other than building and flying. Um, does that make any sense? I probably yeah. doesn't make a bit of sense. Yeah. No, I get it. Uh, it's uh, sometimes it's just very. I know this sounds dumb. Sometimes it sounds very. Sometimes it's very relaxing to just build something and experiment with it. That's how space planes are for me. 
I just find them fun to fly around because usually with a rocket, it's like you're doing all this like technical, you know, maneuvering and stuff. Mm -hmm. But with a space plane, it's like you can easily adjust. Like, okay, I need to just, you know, bank and curve this way. And you just kind of like gently fly around. Yeah. One thing that um, um, I have noticed in my play style is if I'm just building and flying for fun, I, I get creative and I'm constantly doing something new. I'm, I'm always starting, okay, I'll start with this part and then I'll build and I'll do this. And, you know, I'm, I'm, every time I launch a vehicle, it's something very different than the one that I built and launched before. When I'm specifically trying to accomplish something, mm-hmm. that's when I tend to go back to tried and true designs. Um, an example will be, if I build a launch vehicle that is very efficient, a lot of times I will save like the bottom half of it, like the bottom first, first and second stages. Yeah. Um, I will save that, uh, as an assembly and I will, I, I, I no, no example comes to mind, but if I, if I'm going to do a mission or if I'm trying to accomplish something specific, um, I will design my final vehicle all by itself and then I'll go into launch assembly saved launch assemblies and I'll take that and put it on the bottom of it just to get the the new part into orbit yeah I've done that with um, like I would have like science set up or yeah. whatever as a yeah. sub assembly and so it's like instead of having each time to add on you know a mystery goo or a thermometer or anything like I would have some pre-built thing and I'd pop mm-hmm. that on to whatever I was currently doing I think I think part of it is is that um, if you build one thing that works really well and you keep reusing it and never go back and rebuild something, um, you're not really advancing your skill level because you've built it once and it works and that's good enough. If you're constantly rebuilding and redesigning, you're you're that's how you're accidentally stumbling on new and better ways of doing things. Which is part of the fun of the game is coming up with something on the fly, not realizing this actually works better for you than what you had been doing. Whereas if you stick with one vehicle, you're kind of stuck in that mode. Yeah. Um, again, um, you know, I tend to be more experimental when all I'm doing is launching and flying as opposed to when I'm specifically trying to accomplish something. That's when I tend to go back to tried and true designs. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know. I, I hope we answered the when, question. When you find something that works, you kind of want to stick with it. You, sir, are going to love this next letter. The title of it is Nos is Right. Yeah. And we could really just stick with it there. Yeah. That sounds good. You just want to, you just want to repeat that a couple this of times? This comes from Mr. Patrick John L. Gentlemen, this week I repeated a situation Nos spoke of during one of the earlier podcasts, a situation that Biff had not yet encountered. After I experienced the same situation, I repeated the steps with a completely new rocket to confirm that the steps are indeed repeatable. There's nothing worse than an intermittent bug. I landed on the MUN. I used very little fuel from my descent engines. I took off from the surface of the MUN and established a stale orbit using the fuel from my descent engines. I had not touched my return engine yet, so I figured I could hit Minimus before returning to Kerbin. I set up my encounter node and burned for Minimus. Easy money! I still have fuel left in my descent engine and fuel tanks. Thankfully, I F5'd prior to burning to establish the orbit around Minos because when my descent engines ran out of fuel, I was shocked to find that the fuel tank for my return engine was also empty. Curses and gnashes of teeth. How could this happen? The engine questions were on different stages. The, the stage for my return engine was still superior to the descent engine stage. There's no fuel feed between my return fuel tank and the descent engines. I thought of Nos in the podcast where he described the same issue. After returning safely to Kerbin, I built another rocket in a nearly identical configuration and repeated the steps with the same results. Something is definitely afoot. Keep your eye on the nav ball. Patrick John L. Nos is right. That's, those are the best <laughs> letters. You notice we don't ever get letters that say Biff is right. It's like, yeah. All of mine are like varying shades of Biff is wrong. <laughs> Uh, this one comes to us from any key, uh, and he says, Biff, regarding your predictable Eve problems, there is still no oxygen on Eve. So any type of SSTO single stage to orbit that relies upon jet engines is not going to work. If you're still fixing, 
I love the tone of this letter. If you're still fixated on making an SSTO from EVE, it needs to be nuclear or ion powered as SSTO work on hyper efficiency of the engines rather than the brute strength of a normal rocket. My advice on getting off of EVE would be the old Kerbal mantra, needs more boosters. As for mining on EVE, there is no reason to mine that deep down a gravity well. Much easier to mine on one of the moons to fill up there and use just enough fuel to getting aero braking followed by lots of parachutes. You shouldn't need to turn on your engines during descent except for the last 50 feet. That's pretty much what I've been doing. Um, more boosters, more struts, repeat until it works. Regarding your Witcher 3 digression, The Witcher is designed to be a quasi-historical representation that occurred during the past within a generic European country. So yes, gender-specific slurs would be appropriate for a female, and male slurs would be gender-neutral. This is just how things were in the past. Girls were given a much harsher time than, than men. This game is not trying to create a happy fantasy world where good guys were always good, and bad guys were always bad. Everyone is shades of bad just trying to survive. Metascore means absolutely nothing. Doesn't even mean that it's popular, just that Metacritic wants people to think it's popular. And that is a responsible and intelligent counterpoint to the point that was made. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Uh, that's from any key. Uh, the thing I would say, though, the what you're talking about with the historical aspect of The Witcher, that was one of the things that was brought up in the discussion. Uh, quick refresher, uh, in the last episode I talked about, I ran into a yappy little dog from Gamergate who absolutely freaked out at the suggestion that playing as a female and being called all kinds of gender-specific slurs while you played uh, was anything other than a great experience for the female player. Um, and I chimed in because he, his response to it was, here's the Metacritic score. The game is popular. Therefore, deal with it. You're wrong and make me a sandwich. Well, as you point out any key, just because a game is popular doesn't mean that that is correct. Now, as far as the historical part, and this was brought up, this is not me. This was brought up in the discussion, but I do agree with this. Yes, the Witcher is meant to represent a certain point in history. However, there's magic involved. Yeah. So the historicity of it, it, you know, that kind of mutes that argument somewhat. I mean, this is, they're not really trying to recreate a real environment. And if there is a great deal of, I'm sorry, I'm just going to use the word misogyny in, yeah. in games. And if a female player, which is who we're talking about here, bringing this up, if she finds this offensive, and it does not change the game itself, I mean, think about it. The quality of the insults that are being hurled doesn't change the gameplay experience at all. It doesn't make it any more or less enjoyable. It doesn't make it any more or less realistic. So why have it in there? That's kind of my opinion. Yeah, no, I see that. You know, um, being offended by something, um, it's not... As a male, it's not my place to say. Yeah. Now, I mean, I will be the first to say that there are times when people get overly, if, are quick to offend. You know, they're quick to be offended. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is one of those instances because it's not something that I see uh, as necessary. Um, whenever I, I, I will, I will use a debate, uh, a literary debate. Uh, and this this has come up several times, but Huckleberry Finn, okay? Yeah. Jim. Oh, and yeah, his full name in his, the... His, well, his full designation in the book. The book uh, has been banned many places. Um, the fact that he is referred to by the N-word um, has been debated for decades. Yeah. What I look at with stuff like this is intent. Um, and the intent of Jim and Huckleberry Finn was to take on that mindset. Mark Twain was not trying to be a racist by referring to Jim the way he did. In fact, he was challenging the mindset of the day and preceding decades. 
his intent was to shine a light on that kind of racism. So I don't have a problem with Huckleberry Finn because to me, it is integral to the story. The gender slurs in The Witcher 3 are not essential to the story. You could take them out and still have the same game. So there's no point in them being in there. But I do appreciate any key writing in because that is a good, um, that's a good point. Yeah, it is. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think that it is true that intention is everything. Yeah. Um, you know, are you trying to bring across it, you know, the, the world's not full of great people in this setting? Yeah, you can do that. Um, and if you are making your own fantasy world, does like how rooted does it have to be in, yeah. you know, past constructs? And does it like, is it really trying to come across that it's harder for women in that game and they're trying to bring it across with the insults? Or is there another time that they do that besides the insults? Right. Or is it just like an old, you know, way of thinking and an old looking way of looking at the past and you're just like, well, you know, I was easier to think up more words because we have a bigger foundation of words, you know, you use against yeah. women. Well, the way I think of it is you've got a male character playing a scenario and you've got a female character playing a scenario yeah if the npcs in the game are yelling at the male character you know you're a stunted slime yeah if you reuse that for the female does that make any difference no you might as well just use it yeah you know it's like they're the same thing yeah like, I mean, I agree. I mean, I agree with what any K is. Uh, any K. Yeah. <laughs> any key. Sorry. I agree with what he's saying. You yeah. know, yes, the game is meant to represent a certain amount of historical accuracy. And yes, you can argue that the gender specific slurs um, are, are, you know, make it harder for the female character. But it's not necessary. Yeah, it's one of those things that if they were to take it out, would mm -hmm. people be upset that it's gone? Yeah. Like, I don't mean, like, if it was never in the game. Right. If it was never in the game that the, like, you know, would people be writing emails like, how come the insults aren't gender yeah. specific? Yeah. How like, come women don't get more insults than the men? Or, hey, you know, what'd you think of Witcher 3? There wasn't enough gender specific slurs. Yeah. It yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, it all goes back to intent. Uh huh. Do you remember um, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned that I read The Sirens of Titan by Kurt Vonnegut? Yeah. Kurt Vonnegut uh, was well known as a humanist, okay? He was way ahead of his time, long before many people, okay? I mean, he had some very, I mean, he was a very people-friendly person. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me when I read The Sirens of Titan, because remember, I haven't read, I haven't read the book in probably 30 years or so. Yeah. Since the last time I read it. There is a character in the book that, um, speaks in what I would call mid 20th century literature Negro speak. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, he speaks in a pattern that was very typical of authors in the mid 20th century when they were writing quote negro characters yeah and when i first encountered the speech pattern it really stuck out to me because i wasn't used to encountering something like that in a vonnegut book and it really did kind of set me back a little bit because i thought this is this is out of place with what i remember of kurt vonnegut but as i read the book again it was the intent of the character because in some ways, you can argue that that character becomes one of the most noble characters in the book. And the intent of the, quote, Negro speech was not to diminish the character. It was just a mid-20th century author writing the character in the idiom of his time, in the voice of his time. But the character himself was not diminished by it at all. And again, the character came across as in my mind very dignified so i give him a pass on it simply because of the intent mm -hmm. do you see what i'm saying yeah yeah no i i do i see that it's like well when you go back to mark twain and everything he he was showing how kind of stupid it was yeah you know pretty much just just to just put a blade news he he's showing how, how dumb it was that you would see someone as different, and then try to use that as a way to degrade them into being, you know, 
lesser, and the Vonnegut did the same thing. Yeah. Well, there was um, there was a you, you remember when um, well I can't believe we're off on this tangent. Do you remember uh, when when Mark Twain wrote Huckleberry Finn? He wrote the first part of it where they were, they were on the raft, and he got to the point where the raft was run down by a steam. What, what, yeah. do, you, what do you call Just them? The, the steamboats. The yeah. steamboats. Uh, it was they were run over. At that point, Mark Twain was. Uh, I mean, he was out of gas. Uh, I, I won't call it writer's block, but he just he didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. So he set the book aside, and I think it was either a year or two years, and then he picked it up and wrote the rest of the book. Well, part of I mean, he had um, part of what had just happened in the book was Huckleberry Finn had played a joke on Jim, and Jim had stood up for his own dignity. And he, and he was basically saying, you know, you were thinking about how funny it would be to play a joke on me when you didn't realize that I was a person with feelings. Yeah. And Huckleberry Finn, since he's the one narrating the book, apologizes to Jim and then makes comment in the book, you know, um, I humbled myself to this person and in, and I, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not, I'm not, cause I don't have the text in front of me, but basically he says, I humbled myself to this lesser person, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, you know, you can criticize me all you want for doing this, but I'm fine with it mm-hmm. because Jim is a person. And it is a moment where Huckleberry Finn makes character growth. Yeah. Where he suddenly realizes this is a person. This is a thinking, feeling person. And it's a big moment in the book. Um, and, Mark Twain kind of reached that point and it was like, okay, now what? And then he put the book aside. Mm-hmm. And I realize we're way off track as far as The Witcher 3 goes, but the slurs in Witcher 3 are not there for that. Yeah. They're just there. So what's the point? Yeah. It's like they could have easily been taken out and it made no difference. Yeah. Um, I think we've beaten this particular horse enough, don't you? Yeah. Let's, uh, you know, let's go for something lighter. Okay. So something like, uh, well, you know, I'm flight. looking at, I'm looking at the watch that I don't have on my wrist. Yeah. And, and I was thinking to myself that it, it must be time for something. Yeah. What, what time is it? It's time for the tweets. Dun, dun. Time for the tweets. Tweet, tweet. First one is Amy K. Recommendation for the Kerbal Cast Book Club. Fear the Sky by Simon Moss. Which, by the way, uh, based on her recommendation, I went to Amazon. Yeah. The Kindle edition, which they may have changed mm-hmm. since. Yeah. $2.99. Ooh, not bad. I snatched it up in a hurry. Save a tree. Save a tree. Sp- spend three bucks. Mitten Poe. To be honest, I like the older KW Rocketry fairings better. Felt more robust. It's more filling, more rich. <laughs> this KW Rocket fairings light, it's just not, it's not as good. Uh-huh. Epic Jobster, I'm slowly catching up, but I'm 10 episodes behind again, and I haven't sent an email in a while, so I'm kind of missing some references. That's okay. They're, yeah. they're not worth it. <laughs> you know, it's coconuts to me. Jarmenia, best of KSP. Rocket wants to keep flipping over during ascent, but you time the thrust burst just well enough to get into orbit. Yeah, I've done the somersault launches before. Yeah. I, you know, and those are the ones where you always think, you know, it's you think, I've lost it. And then you manage to get into orbit anyway, and it's like, yeah. oh, I guess well, not. <laughs> everything worked out. Lucas Seum, have either of you ever read 2001 A Space Odyssey? You should. The movie makes so much more sense. It was written that way. Yeah. Um, the idea was that the book and the movie were supposed to go parallel. Like, like synergize. Uh, 2001 is good. 2010 is As a matter of fact, all of the Space Odyssey books are good. Now, mm. they're all good in different ways. Yeah. But... Of course, it's Arthur C. Clarke, so... Your results may vary. <laughs> J. Arthur, recommendation for the Kerbal Cast Book Club, Ark Royal book series by Christopher G. Nuttall. Have you notice that we have uh, we, we are becoming more literary? Yeah. We're becoming very refined. Yeah. Jock Adair, is it unusual for a person to randomly pull up a Google map of Mars and immediately recognize the route Mark Watney took, of, uh, took to Ares 4? I'm guessing that's a Martian reference. Yeah, that is a Martian yeah. reference. Have you seen the um have you seen the trailer? No. Oh sweet. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna have to show it to you. <laughs> there is uh somebody tweeted out um a um a little section of the Mars map 
and they have chartered out Mark Watney's um, two trips, but they've chartered it out because he uses recognizable landmarks throughout the book. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, yeah, isn't it amazing that you can actually, you can read a book and then look at an actual Mars map and see? Yeah. Anyway. Lanyard 73. Biff, Lost Fleet Series by Jack (laughs) Campbell is A-M-A-Z-I-N-G. I've read them all. I uh, I talked about the Lost Fate, um, the first book, Dauntless. Yeah, I was eighty percent of the way through the book when I was talking about it, and I said unless the last twenty percent absolutely sucked, that it mm. was a great book. It was a great book. I strongly recommend the Lost Fleet series. Andy M. Biff should try Robinson Crusoe board game. It's even more brutal than when you first installed Far and Deadly Reentry. It is that game is tough. Is it like uh, like uh, at the game shop the the store owner and I we will play a game of it mm-hmm. every week, and it's just yeah, it it beats the crap out of you. And second tweet, Nos, I got my copy of Imperial Settlers signed by Ignacy last week at UK Ga- Games Expo. That's awesome. I was watching a lot of uh, tweets coming out of that expo, and a lot of cool things are popping up. What is Imperial Settlers? Imperial Settlers. It's another game made by the same designer as Rob- the Robinson Crusoe board game, and you uh, each play like a. A civilization so there's like japan egypt you know all those and you uh build and compete i haven't played it yet i really want to i just haven't um had a copy come through my game shop and i kind of only buy local now just oh, okay. to support the game shop that i hang out at like i could get it online but I, I like supporting my local game stores what was the game you were talking about a couple of weeks ago where the the way to end the game was to get the nuke and you said you were too busy Oh, the Bil- way uh, that capital. was Twilight Imperium. The, ah, way, the okay. way to win was to secure the like this one desired planet, and I didn't even care. I was just like building up a market empire, you know, and uh, like I I was the richest guy in the galaxy. Like you can have your planet. I'm rich. <laughs> I love how I turned acquire a planet into acquire a new. <laughs> apparently, that's apparently that's, you know what it is. I think I was confusing the civilization games. Oh yeah, yeah. One of the weirdest. You know, the the Civilization games, even though they use historical figures, mm-hmm. they're not historically accurate. Yeah. For example, Gandhi tends to be a warmonger in the game, uh-huh. which I think is just... <laughs> it's gold. It is It is so weird to tell somebody about that. It's like, yeah, I won the game. How'd you win the game? I nuked Gandhi. Yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? You nuked Gandhi? Next one from Alex Boyd. According to my ex-industrial chemist father, Dr. Pepper tastes like nitrobenzene. Mm, mm, love nit- me some nitrobenzene. nitrobenzene. Free toss. The Kerbal Cast space plane won't work well on EVE. No oxygen means the jet engines won't work. Doesn't carry enough rocket fuel. Do you know what they're, you know what they're dinging us on there? What? You and I, it's, we are stuck in a loop. Um, and I, I keep forgetting. We'll talk about EVE. Okay, yeah. and I will talk about okay, my latest attempt to get to Eve and back failed. Mhm. And then you will say your part of the loop is you should do space plane. And then me forgetting we've had this conversation before goes, "Hey, that's a great yeah, idea." Yeah, we have done that. Now that I think about it. And so now we and 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 then the cycle repeats because then people start writing in letters going, "You can't do that." Yeah, and then a couple of weeks later, I say, "Hey, I went to Eve and failed." And you go, "You should try space planes." And I say, "That's a great idea." <laughs> anyway, that's why they're dinging us for the fact that yeah. we. I think we, this is like our third time now. Haywood Floyd, Top Gun references. When? Yeah. Uh, whenever we got space planes, we're talking about Buzz in the Tower. Yeah. Um, I don't remember when else. I have a suggestion. Yeah. I found out from Ascalon. He hates Will Ferrell as much as I hate she who must not be named. Uh-huh. From now on, anytime we are tempted to use a Top Gun reference, let's do a Talladega Nights reference instead. Oh, okay. Okay? Same stuff. Shake and bake. <laughs> JD Rock, Kerbalcast believes in equality. Great game plus inclusive view equals successful podcast. Yay. Well, thank you. And lots of discussion of Huckleberry yeah. Finn. Rescinder to be. I want to say one word to you, just one word. Airships. Exactly. How do you mean? Yeah. Swag Linkton. Let's start a new career in KSP and get the green men to space. And these last two are in reference to Biff's floating asteroid tweet. Gilhenge, 
get a large one, and hey presto, private island. MK-3424, surprisingly even with all the heat and reentry, the asteroids won't burn up or break apart. Hey, Nas. Yeah. What time isn't it? It's not time for the tweets. Tweets, tweets. Time for the tweets. Not. Not time for the tweets. Final stage expended. And as we wrestle this sucker to the ground, we hand the stick over to somebody more qualified than us. Greetings, Kerbinauts. Free Toss here with Episode 9 of Free Toss Flight Fundamentals. First off, I'd like to thank everyone who came to my first couple of Twitch streams this week. I had a lot of fun and hope you guys did too. It's certainly something I'll keep doing. More on that in my closing. Last week in Flight Fundamentals, I talked about the basic concepts that go into constructing VTOL aircraft in KSP. This week, I'm going to be discussing how to pilot this type of aircraft. VTOL piloting has three main phases, just like regular flying. Takeoff, normal flight, and landing. What makes VTOLs more difficult to fly are the transitions between these three phases, the transitions between vertical and horizontal flight. Just like with the Kerbalcast space plane, I've also uploaded a Kerbalcast VTOL to Kerbal X. You guys can use it as a sample craft, and I know that these tips work well with that aircraft. Biff and Nos should provide a link to the Kerbal X page in the episode description. On the runway, make sure that your cargo bay doors are open and that your vertical engine is activated. Throttle to full with SAS on, and you should be able to take off vertically and hover by controlling your throttle. If you have Kerbal Engineer, watch your thrust to weight ratio as you change your throttle level. Once you've picked up a few hundred meters of altitude, you can transition to horizontal flight. If you're playing stock, you can nose down, which will cause you to move forward like a helicopter. Once you pick up some horizontal speed, hit action group 3 to light your horizontal engine. After you pick up over about 100 meters per second, you can hit action group 2 to shut down your vertical engine, and then action group 1 to close the cargo bay. From here, you should be able to pull up and fly it like a normal plane. If you're using FAR, controlling the aircraft while hovering is significantly touchier. It'll take practice, but for reasons I'm not 100% sure of, it doesn't want to tip forward as you hover off of the runway. Keep the nose level with the horizon as you take off vertically, and activate the horizontal engine without pitching up or down for the best results. When you want to land, you have to transition back to vertical flight. To do this, you have to kill your horizontal speed. Hit the B key to activate the air brakes, which do a great job of slowing you down in both stock and far. Kill your horizontal engine, open the cargo bay, and slowly increase your throttle on the vertical engine. To stay in control, try and keep the plane level as you lose horizontal speed, but keep your vertical speed low with the vertical engine. With luck and practice, you'll be able to enter a controlled descent. Again, this transition will be far trickier with Ferrum. If you find yourself pitching in a direction you don't want to, I find yawing by 180 degrees helps to regain control. With stock aerodynamics, you should be able to pitch, yaw, and roll on your vertical engine at will and fly around like a helicopter. You may notice a probe core just in front of the vertical stabilizer. It's there to help with landing. Once you transition to a controlled vertical descent, switch control to that probe core and fly it like a rocket. Beware that doing so will swap the yaw and roll control keys. You can even use the hold retrograde SAS setting, which is fantastic for killing any horizontal velocity you may have. Control your descent using the throttle, and try and touch down below about 10 meters per second for the best results. And, in case you're wondering, the Kerbalcast VTOL is also capable of traditional horizontal takeoff and landing in both far and stock aero. Piloting VTOLs, especially the transition from horizontal back to vertical flight, can be tricky, and may take quite a bit of practice before you're sticking landings on top of the vehicle assembly building. But once you get the hang of it, VTOLs are a lot of fun, and like I said before, useful for hunting anomalies on mountains or other hard-to-reach places on Kerbin. That's it for this week. If you have any questions or suggestions for future topics, you can feel free to send me a message on Steam or tweet to me at freetoss 7 In addition, you should follow me on Twitter since I'll tweet out my plans for holding Twitch streams. I may not be as good or as popular as Dos Valdez, but I hope you'll join me for live sessions of Flight Fundamentals or just to watch me mess around in my career save. Look for me there at twitch.tv freetoss7. I hope to see you in a stream real soon, but if not, 
I'll talk to you again next week and try my hand at explaining low carbon orbit rendezvous, my first non-aircraft topic. Home to your mobile. All right, thank you. And I'm looking forward to that. If anyone can do it, it's him. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was uh, when I was watching his Twitch stream, um, you know, as I said, his method of rendezvous is really not that much different than mine, but his is easier to explain because his relies on very specific do this, do this, do this. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, in, in, in his defense, mine relies a certain degree on feel. Yeah. You know, I get to a certain point and I kind of feel my way through it, mm -hmm. which is great for me, but it's hard to explain. And, um, part of my problem with rendezvous or part of my bad reputation about rendezvous. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is go back some episodes and listen to me attempt to explain rendezvous. Yeah. And listen to me tie my tongue and do multiple shapes. I mean, I've, I mean, I've had people write me and say, Biff, I've done rendezvous several times. Mm -hmm. I can't even follow what you're talking about. <laughs> so, I mean, I've done a horrible job of explaining rendezvous. Yeah. And, I mean, a lot of people try to tackle it and yeah. it's just, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to get across. Yeah. But. Especially um, once you take the video component out mm -hmm. and you're trying to explain it in terminology that is simple, that's when you really start twisting yourself into knots. Yeah. But, um, all, but all of it without a visual component. Yeah. Watching him build and fly the hover jets is really cool. Yeah. The one that he was, um, the Twitch stream that I watched, um, this is going to make it sound funny, but follow but follow with me let me explain it the hovercraft that he built or the hover jet looked like a duck now when i say duck what i mean is do you know how ducks um you know they have the small head and then mm -hmm. the neck starts to flare out and then you've got kind of that bulbous yeah. you know how ducks almost look like flying bowling pins to some extent mm -hmm. you know they go from the small head and then they flare out but they're yeah. very angular yeah that's how when he was flying his plane he would bank it to where you were looking at the bottom of the plane, uh, you know, you were looking up at the bottom of the plane and the wings. Mm -hmm. And the shape of the fuselage itself, going from the very small cockpit, flaring out into the body, it really, it resembled a flying duck. Yeah. And I know, you know, flying duck, it just sounds funny. But it was actually very graceful. Yeah. And the 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 thing that, amazed me about the ship that he was flying was that everything it did visually you could almost see a center pivot point and it was very stable everything he did pivoted on this one point whereas everything that i've ever built space plane wise always seems to be like wobbling all over the place mm -hmm. This was like on one center pivot, and everything it did, whether it dipped its nose, raised its nose, banked left, banked right, whatever, was all centered on this one point, and it was incredibly stable. And he, from a dead stop, lifted straight up in the air, started moving forward, went into aerodynamic flight or ballistic motion, then brought it to a complete stop, and then a, a hover, and then brought it down for a landing. Yeah. And he did it two or three times with the same plane. Yeah. And, you know, and the whole time, and, you know, going back to what I was talking about last week, every time he'd do it, I would just go, I hate free toss. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, if you want to learn how to do hover jets and now rendezvous, mm -hmm. free toss is the man, not the man. D man. D d d the, no, the man. The man. The man. Not D. Duh. 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 No, duh is me. <laughs> I'm, I'm duh. duh. Duh, man. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. Uh, we want to thank everybody who sent in letters and, uh, and the audio letters as well. It is really nice to hear, uh, from listeners. Uh, strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, send us MP3s. Love to hear from you. Uh, also, thank you so much, uh, for folks who, uh, sent in, uh, tweets as well. Uh, it was it was fun to send out the floating asteroid picture. Yeah, it was like, huh? I'm, I I would love. I, I know Squad will not answer this, but I'm just I'm curious if if there is something in the game code that asteroids and atmosphere just don't 
the game just doesn't it just know doesn't it. work out. Yeah, well, I, I, you would think that the mass of the asteroid, it wouldn't matter. But I think something in the coding, the asteroid in atmosphere, the game just doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, surely they had to expect somebody would try and... Bring the thing down. Yeah, wipe yeah. out the dinosaurs with yeah. an asteroid. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe the, game, maybe the game crash was the Easter egg. Who knows? We also want to do a thank you to the subreddit, subreddit moderators <laughs> for Kerbal Space Program and Kerbal Academy. And episode music comes to us from Professor Soap. Look for him on Facebook or at profsoaplive.com. And a big thank you to Askalon, Will Farrell's biggest fan, uh, who is posting episodes of Kerbalcast to YouTube each week. And he's also leading the effort to transcribe those episodes so that the subtitles actually make some semblance of sense. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're hampered by the fact that they're subtitling us. <laughs> Which doesn't always make a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. But if you would like to help him uh, do this, uh, they are working their way through quite a few episodes, and we keep adding episodes every week, so it's a never-ending task. Yeah. But please contact Askalon. You can find him on Twitter, at Ent, E-N-T, Def. Just think of the walking trees from The Lord of the Rings. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can email us at kerbalpodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at Kerbalcast. And subscribe to us on iTunes. And all episodes of Kerbalcast can be found at kerbalpodcast.libsyn.com. If you want to hurl all kinds of abuse at us, uh, we are on Steam, Biff Aldrin, and Nostromo. If you'd like to support KerbalCast, you can donate at patreon.com slash KerbalCast. And thank you to everybody who has. Uh, it It doesn't... We're basically trying to cover server costs. Yeah. So uh, it, it doesn't take much uh, to help us in a big way. So thank you. Thank you very much. Again, patreon.com forward slash KerbalCast. Well, that wraps it up for episode 53 of KerbalCast, E-L-E, extension. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I had trouble with this at the beginning. Yeah, you did. Let me try it again. Uh, Episode 53, E-L-E, extinction level event. I am your LMP, that's Lunar Module Pilot Biff Aldrin, our CMP, Command Module Pilot. Nostromo. Until next time, happy Happy Kerbaling. So you two, um, dig up, dig up dinosaurs? <laughs> oh. oh. Try to. <laughs> dinosaurs. I really hate that man. <laughs> dinosaurs. I really hate that man. Dinosaurs. I really hate that man. Oh. Don't you see the danger? What you're doing here, genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that found his dad's gun. I really hate that man. Oh. I'll tell you the problem with the scientific power that you're, that you're using. Oh. Oh. It didn't require any discipline to attain. I really hate that man. Oh. You'll have to get used to talk to Malcolm. I really hate that man. So you two, um, oh. dig, up, dig up dinosaurs? You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves. No, no, you read what others had done, and you and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves. I really hate that man. So you don't take any responsibility. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses to accomplish something as fast as you could. Oh. And now. Oh. Oh. So you two, um, dig up, dig up dinosaurs? I really hate that man. Oh. Dinosaurs, dinosaurs had their shot, and nature selected them for extinction. Dinosaurs, I really hate that man. Oh. Dinosaurs, dinosaurs, I really hate that man. Oh. Dino, dinosaurs, I really hate that man. Oh. Dinosaurs, I really hate that man. Oh. Dinosaurs, I really hate that man. Oh. Dinosaurs. I really hate that man. Oh. <laughs> Dinosaurs. I really hate that man. Oh. <laughs> yes, this is some species that was obliterated by deforestation. <laughs> So you two, um, 
Big up, big up dinosaur. Oh. I really hate that man. Oh. Dinosaurs. 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 I really hate that man. Oh. Yes, yes, we don't move. Now, now eventually you do find have dinosaurs on your on your dinosaur tour, right? <laughs>